for a bill of this. Give him a big round of applause. Hello, welcome everyone, and welcome to my talk about finding some weird and wacky vulnerabilities during my relatively short career. But before I get into it, um, I've just got to do a few disclaimers. So, this is a highly informal presentation, so <laughs> I am not going to follow any rules on how to do presentations well, like expect text all over the place. And yeah, this is not going to reflect how it works professionally. This is, all <laughs> um, this is really just for fun. So, a bit about myself, so I've been passionate about like offensive security since 2019. Um, been quite involved with like different CTFs um, with like Index Fluid or Down Under CTF. I'm currently working as a security consultant for Eltum. I previously worked at the WA Office of Digital Government as a penetration tester, and I have a crippling addiction hacking things, and that's a bit of a call to help. So yeah, so why am I doing this talk? Well. I missed out on buying per B size perf tickets. <laughs> so, so, plan A was to try and social engineer as a UWA staff member, but that's committing a crime, which I'm not too fond of doing. So, the next plan was submitting a talk, and I was like, oh, I've always wanted to do a talk, and especially this talk. Which is awesome, because I was getting a bit desperate for my next plan. So. <laughs> anyway, um, no, the real reason why I wanted to do this talk was like, I really enjoy sort of teaching others about security and discussing cool vulnerabilities. Um, and I also want to sort of show what my methodology is, or try to, and sort of doing deep dive into different like, vulnerabilities. So I did a guest lecture at UWA about a year ago, and earlier on this year did a set talks presentation, and I've just sort of merged them together into this talk. So let's begin. So I'm gonna, if you've seen one of my previous talks, I've sort of rambled on about this methodology called input space on partitioning, and basically it's a process for identifying what's called a characteristic of an input. And you can sort of think of a characteristic as some attribute of an input which could manipulate the behavior. And the really important thing of this methodology is that it helps you identify like test cases or more specifically negative test cases, which um, a lot of software engineers and testers sort of miss out on. So in a nutshell, just for warning, I'm really simplifying the actual process. Um, what you do is, let's say you pick whatever function, method, thing that runs, and you identify all the inputs going into it. So that it can also include like function parameters or like system state. And then for each of those different inputs, you keep on sort of partitioning that input domain. Um, I'm going to explain this for pictures in a bit. And so you get smaller, smaller partitions, which sort of make sense with the intended behavior. And then from there, you can choose values for each of those partitions, and then you have, you have your test cases. So I'm going to do an example here with a super secure REST API that I wrote using the Express framework. Um, it's for storing notes on a MySQL database where you write your message and then you put in a key. And the idea of this REST API is that you can't read that message unless you have that key. Un unless you have that key. And so I wrote this in Node.js um, using the Express Web Framework and I'm using the Next.js library, which is an SQL query builder slash client um, library for querying that MySQL database. And we're just going to do input space partitioning on that where um, method there. So just a full warning, there is a lot of different types of syntaxes for that where function. I'm just going to look specifically at how it's used here, where the key is the only user input going in here. Um, so yeah, and a good place to sort of start off is actually sort of questioning what should be the actual type of the input going in. And because JavaScript is like a dynamically typed language, you can do a lot of funky stuff with it because everything's an object. Um, first thing you probably want to check for is, it, is it actually a string? And then you sort of keep on asking these questions and breaking down the problem. For example, if it isn't a string, we could say ask, well, is it a number of Boolean? And if it is, what should happen? But if it isn't, like, is it an object or an array? What is the behavior there? We also need to consider as well what the threats are for those inputs. So for example, I sort of break down, like, is it a non-alphanumeric characters in there? Thinking of like SQL injection, because those inputs are going to go to an SQL query. We should probably test for that. And then 
for the intended behavior, I just sort of made up some things. I can't read the developer's minds, but we could say, like, going from the top, like, let's say if it's an object and array input, uh, let's see if it gets passed to a string and make sure that there's no errors. And then for the other input, we, the intended behavior could be we just accept it and make sure that there's no SQL errors. Cool. All right. Let's do some testing and we'll try out this first object input. And here, we've got Burp Suite, just sort of whack it in there, see what happens. Looks all good. Ah, we, we've got an SQL error. All right, now we've got a cool bug, because if we have an SQL error, that means that we might have something interesting going on here, especially dealing with queries. So let's dig a bit deeper. So looking at the query, what's actually happened here, that where clause looks really whack, because now it's like P is equal to X, which is equal to something. And we should probably look into what's happening here. So when I was sort of looking into this, the first thing I looked into was what was those back two characters? And they are called something quoted identifiers, which um, basically in MySQL mean you're just trying to quote a specific thing. So, oh, like some identifier. And in this case, it was trying to quote um, a column. But the problem here was that in that notes table, which I'm trying to query, there is no column named X, which gives you the pretty self-explanatory error of saying there is no column named X in this clause. But what if we try and query by a column that is in that table? What happens then? We dump the database, or that table. Um, does that make sense? No. So we need to dig even deeper. Um, and this is where you go to the documentation, and I sort of found that with these um, operators, um, you've got to look at like the precedence, and with these one, these comparison operators, they all treated with the same precedence, which is the order of processing things, which means that it gets evaluated from left to right. So that key equals message bit is equal to first, and if we check what that's equal to, it returns zero, which is basically meaning false, which is zero is false, one is true um, for my SQL, which makes sense because key is not equal to message. But then, if we dig further into that documentation, and we see that MySQL tries to be a bit smart when it does a comparison with some number with a string, it will try and convert that string into a number format first, and there's the documentation proof. So what happens if you try and convert a non-numeric string to a number? Well, it tries to return false. So like that's obviously not a number. It returns zero, which is false. But you see, we've got a bit of a problem here. Because that bit's equal to zero, that bit will call, is then doing a comparison, a string comparison with an integer, so it's going to try and convert it to a number. That bit turns um, false as well, which leaves you with zero is equal to zero, which is true, which means that <laughs> <laughs> we've just dumped that table. Yeah. So, cool, let's hack Next.js now. Um, so, yeah, so here we are, just a reminder that was the vulnerable code as well. Um, throw that in and now we just dump that table with that message with, without even knowing the key. Cool bug. Someone else thought it was a cool bug six years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> it was only fixed because um, I didn't find this bug, but um, this guy Alec, he made a CTF challenge about this last year. And it just sort of Weeded me out. I was like, what the, like, is this a no day? And he was like, no, nah, mate, it's a 2,460 day. And, <laughs> um, I have a lot to say about Next.js, but um, I've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole, so I'm um, <laughs> going back. Um, so you see why like, that input space partitioning methodology is quite important. It helps you sort of identifying those bugs um, in a quite a methodical way, because in reality, all security vulnerabilities are bugs or features. Um, that we just try to exploit. And the input space partitioning is a good way of planning those test cases or, or testing things which are completely unintended um, and then investigating those bugs. And I actually learned about this while I was studying here at UWA. Um, and I was taught by a professor named Aaron Stewart who taught uh, software testing and quality assurance unit. And the awesome thing is done, if you want to look into this further, um, all the unit content for that unit's available for free online there. Speaking of which, I've got a story about um, Professor Aaron Stewart as well, about a different weird vulnerability. So, while I was doing that unit, he made a website quite quickly for um, validating your assignment. So, one of the components was we had to write some test code in Java, 
And then he made this uh, uh, website saying, hey, you zipped up your code in a zip file, upload it, and then the website will sort of say, yep, I can compile your code. However, the Java, um, the client side code on the website revealed that that terminal command, the, it was running the Java C terminal command there, and it's throwing what's the user supplied inputs, which is the file name, straight into that command. So I was a bit worried about it, so I messaged him saying, hey, I'm a bit concerned. He was, and the Mad Lab was like, yeah, go ahead and try and test it. So I was quite excited. <laughs> Actual video of me there. Um, <laughs> Um, but before I jumped straight into that code, I was like, okay, let's break down the actual process of what this web application is doing. So the first step was it was uploading a zip file. So we're always going to check to see if there's like a file upload vulnerability. So examples like directory traversal where you try and like save it to a different location. But that didn't work. So um, next thing as well, you can sometimes do funky things with extracting files and you extract them into different locations. Um, by naming them weirdly, or not with zip, but with like tar archives, you can do like symbolic links. I'm not going to bother explaining that. That didn't work. So I was like, okay, let's dig into the Java C command a bit further, because it just seems a bit suspicious. Um, and then the first idea I had, sort of breaking this down further, is like, okay, I could probably do inject an additional command there. I'm within the file name, but. How Aaron programmed his website, he was directly called, calling the Java C program. So there was no like shell program to interpret those additional commands being injected. So the next option I thought, okay, there could be some vulnerability in Java C compiling those files. However, I'm a monkey, so I skipped that. Um, <laughs> and I went to looking into if I can do a command argument injection. And I confirmed it. Um, unfortunately, no screenshots, but I did it just by like printing out the version of Java that he was using. So let's dig even, even further now. So going to the documentation, I found this dash J option for the Java C command, which quote says, it allows changing options for the runtime environment. And when I hear about changing something that of the runtime environment, could I maybe like change it to run my own thing instead? And digging even further, that's when I found this Java agent option, which is a pretty cool feature. Um, it's used for, quote, intercepting applications running on the JVM, which means that it's going to intercept and run before the actual Java C command compiles things, which means that I can probably throw in my own malicious code into there and sort of just run whatever. So tested it out, um, compiled my own, named it that. Next file, that's sort of exploiting that command argument injection, so it's going to load it in as a Java agent. And then, nice, reverse shell on my professor's website. <laughs> <laughs> so, cool stuff. Um, I also thought it was good sort of showing that, going down that tangent a bit, because it sort of shows that breaking down of the actual process and sort of testing each of the different points. And also, especially dig really deep into the documentation and code, because there are a lot of weird features in like applications and software that everyone's using, which is there in the documentation, but just no one thinks about it. Um, so yeah. Now we're on to the final case study. I guess some of you might guess what this is. Um, some of you probably have heard my talks in the past about this or have seen my ramblings on a blog post somewhere. Um, but if you're just not aware, so um, Strapi is what's called a headless content management system. So more traditional content management systems sort of couple together the front end and like the back end web components into like a single product where headless content management systems more just focus on the back-end functionality. So it leaves like developers free to build their own website, which then sort of calls back to the headless CMS to get content. And Strapi is one of the biggest ones. And so yeah, why did I start testing it? Well, I just got bored during New Year's and Christmas. Um, <laughs> there were no Capture the Flag events on. I don't really have a social life. So yeah, I Googled Node.js CMS. Um, click the top result, and yeah, it was strapping. And after a few weeks, um, yeah, it had some pretty bad vulnerabilities there. 
Um, I'm going to go through and sort of dig into each one and just sort of explain how they work. Except for that one, um, long story short, um, basically it was like a community contribution where um, the developer was didn't, just forgot to verify like a JWT award token for um, AWS Cognito Login Provider. And then the strapping developers were like distracted by like the rest of the pull requests and then they were like, oh, merge, it's fine. Um, not that interesting, but yeah. Let's get into the cool stuff for um, server-side template injection to remote code execution. So here, so when you're doing sort of like the source code analysis, um, there's sort of two different approaches, or well, there's a lot more, but there's two main where you do like a top-down approach where you try and find your sources and you see if they end up into different sort of dangerous constructs. Here, I sort of did a more of a bottom-up approach where I saw them using this Lodash template engine and if you read the documentation for this, um, that template engine um, evaluates the text between delimiters um, as JavaScript code, which sounds awesome to me, because if I can put my own JavaScript code in there, then is that an easy remote code execution vulnerability? And I sort of looked for where I could put it in, and I noticed as a super administrator, you can modify these email templates. So I was like, oh, this is an easy win. So I stole a payload from Twitter, um, threw it in there, uh, now, screw it, I must. Um, and threw it in there and it got some error. And I was like, okay, let's look into what's error. Oh, validation error. Something's going wrong here. And here's the code. Um, yeah, it sort of felt like this was happening to me. <laughs> <laughs> However, I'm a stubborn monkey. And I was like, okay, I saw you using that dangerous construct there, let me see what's actually the validation occurring. So, oh no, registers patterns. <laughs> Put your hand up if you can read that. Thought so. Me, me neither. <laughs> I had to cheat a bit, but I'll try and explain what's happening. Um, so, those regex patterns on the left there, what they were doing, you can think of them as like a deny list, where what they were trying to do was only allow one type of template deliverer to be used. So, um, there was quite a few you could use with Lodash. Um, the, that one in the middle was the only one they wanted to use. That's easy to bypass. The hard one was the allow list where what they were doing with that only allow templated delimiter was grabbing all the text in between it and then comparing it with an allow list. And if there was anything that didn't match, it was completely rejected. However, they all made one mistake in each one of those three regex patterns. And I'm going to try my best to explain it. Um, yeah. So, pulling apart that example there, um, what that character list is actually saying is it's going to match any character except for the characters which are the curly brackets. And then when you combine that with the asterisks, it's, you're basically saying match that token, so which is the match any character, um, zero or more times. So you're basically saying that uh, match any set of characters except for the curly brackets. And then it's matching it between the dollar curly brackets um, thing. So if you put in one of those curly brackets which are excluded, you just suddenly break the grouping and then just nothing ever matches. So here we go, pictures to explain. So um, on the top there, clearly there's no curly brackets in between these characters and it correctly matches. But as soon as I throw it in there, the regex pattern suddenly just does not, because it's breaking the grouping and it doesn't spot anything. And all of those regex checks had the same issue. So yeah, cool thing. So we can now manipulate the payload. Um, I fully don't expect anyone to read that in these slides. So roses are red, violets are blue. I have a proof of concept for you. <laughs> <laughs> now, before I continue, um, in, as a security tester, we normally sort of quantify like how bad a vulnerability is with like risk ratings or CVSS scores and stuff. But let me introduce you to a new one, spicy level. <laughs> so this is a certified high. Um, you'll feel it the next day, but it's not that bad. Um, because at least you need to be a super admin to exploit it. I wonder if there was a way to become a super admin. <laughs> um, long title, I'll go ahead and explain this. So how I found this one was I was just sort of mucking around on the admin sort of portal. And I noticed I had this, oh, it's a bit hard to read. But they have this cool feature where you can filter by a user's um, password reset token. 
which is the token for resetting their account password, which was like, hmm, that's a good feature. Wonder if I can exploit this. And um, it didn't actually sort of show the actual value, just for some reason you were allowed to filter by it. And I was thinking, oh, I can probably filter not just by that token, but any private field um, for those user accounts. So let's dig into it. So a bit of context as well about Strapi. So Strapi has sort of two sort of APIs you can use. So there was a GraphQL one, which wasn't vulnerable to this. But the REST API one was. And how you would sort of call that REST API is you give like a URL path of what you want to query. So that one up there is for querying the admin sort of REST API. And what you do is then you add filters as like get parameters at the end of the URL. So this filter here is basically saying, hey, filter by a user's password that starts with the character A. And then we can sort of check and see, okay, the response length is zero, so we know that the user's password doesn't start with the character A. But it means that we can just brute force that character until we finally see a response length change. And we did that eventually when we hit that dollar sign, where suddenly it now blows up and we get a different response length. So we know that the password starts with the dollar sign. And we can just keep on doing it character by character to eventually leak out the full sort of password hash. So this was the initial proof of concept which I sent to them. Um, originally, I thought you can only exploit this as an admin, and you can see that it just sort of dumps out the user's password hash. But um, yeah, so I reported the vulnerability to them. I was about to go back to work, and I was like, okay, they should be told about this as soon as possible, but at least it's only admins able to exploit this. But I was a little bit worried, and I just had like a nagging feeling that it was a little bit worse. So later on, I decided to sort of dig into other things within Strapi, such as plugins, and I noticed they had this interesting like author user relation in this common plugin. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if you can just filter by relational fields as well to get to the app, like, whatever user account. And so this is how I confirmed the vulnerability is I'm now sort of adding in filter by that author user, and then we're gonna filter by the password hash again. And I'm just gonna, just to confirm the issue, I'm just gonna see if the password hash starts with those characters because all password hashes on Strap start with the dollar two way. And if we have a response length which is not zero, then it's confirmed. Oh, we have a response length which is not zero, which means that we could do this on off. <laughs> but wait, it gets even worse. <laughs> because Strapi automatically populates these fields, so when you're on the sort of CMS, you can sort of add content, and these created by and updated by fields were automatically being populated with the sort of corresponding admin user that did the action. So I was like, hmm, could I just filter by those fields instead? Because if I could do that, then nearly every Strapi server in the world would be vulnerable to this because the whole point of Strapi is to serve content, but then you're exploiting the thing that's serving that content to dump out the data. So once again, just a bit of short proof of concept, I changed that relational field to created by, changed it to some, I just made a collection called articles, and yep, we can dump that. So, <laughs> getting pretty bad now. Let's make it worse. <laughs> Let's change the two together to get unauthenticated RC. So, um, the general process is you've got to first find one of those API collection endpoints, which is like open on the internet. And then once you can do that, you can just exploit that leak vulnerability to then find an entry that was created by a super administrator user. Then once you've got that, you just dump their email, do the forgot my password um, process, and then just dump their reset token. And then you're free to just to change the password, log in, and then there's that remote code execution vulnerability from earlier. Cool. And this was the final proof of concept which was sent, where on the top there, sort of find an entry that was created by that super admin, dump the reset token, and that's on the bottom getting a reverse shell there. So, yeah. <laughs> Really bad. Um, I did make a short video sort of that summarized the whole story quite well. I hope it loads.
the next slide. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> so, um, after I did the disclosure, um, it's inspired one of the, um, this guy Boogie, who was a big community developer within Strapi, to actually sort of go through and look through it. And the cool thing was he figured out that although Strapi was sort of preventing filtering directly those private fields, you could still filter by non-existent fields within the table. And he then sort of researched a bit further and found a pretty cool bypass to that vulnerability. So we'll just dig into it now. So here, for example, I sort of query by like some non-existent column name, and we get a 500 response, which gives us another SQL error. So let's dig into this further and see what's actually happening here. So Looking at the query that what um, that occurs, we can see that um, even though that column name doesn't exist, still being whacked into the query. But then Strapi is also putting in these table aliases into the query as well, which means that although we couldn't like let's say query by like a user's password, we could then sort of query by that table alias dot password, and that was a pretty it was a really cool bypass. And um, yeah. Um, so Boogie sort of informed me about it, I was like, okay, let's dig into and see how bad this is. And we sort of found these different scenarios where it could be exploited. And yeah, fortunately not as bad as the original vulnerability, but I was thinking that it could be impact other object relational mappers out there, because it seems like a fairly common mistake to occur. But um, that's a project for another time. I just sort of thought I would share that idea out to the world, because the reason why is it's important that we sort of share what we know, sort of do these ramblings, because security is an iterative process. And I also like sort of like sharing with others what I've known, what I've worked on, and stuff, so that we all improve and also inspire not only our, like security testers, but software engineers as well. So Strapi and also Boogie are like a brilliant sort of like case study of this, where um, I've been talking with Derek, who was like the main person I was recording these vulnerabilities to at Strapi, um, and he was telling me about how the culture around the security within Strapi has completely changed, where beforehand they would get reports and it's like, oh, it's another report, to actually viewing with intrigue and doing those deep dives into understanding exactly what's the issue. And with the community developers as well, it was actually really cool seeing Boogie finding a bug and then going through and digging further and seeing how bad it was because um, some of those, I didn't mention in the slides, that filter link one, that was reported in about seven different GitHub issues on the Strapi repository, but no one connected the dots that you could do that. So it was great seeing the developers themselves actually finding these bugs and then digging into it further. So yeah, so what do we learn from this talk? Um, hopefully something, um, <laughs> bugs are cool. I um, hope some of you remember that input space positioning methodology earlier because it's a, quite a helpful sort of tool to identify test cases and especially find those like weird bugs. Um, thought of, um, hope some of you sort of learned about sort of like breaking down and understanding processes and yeah, share your knowledge without others. But the most important thing is always throw in monkey gifts in your bundles. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, um, any questions? Oh, yeah. Do you have a favorite one with all the you haven't mentioned? Um, probably the email template one was a pretty cool one just to sort of stumble across because I was like, ah, oh, that, so that code's been was sitting in the repository for like years. It's been open source and then it was just sort of a nice little trick to bypass. Yeah. And Div? Um, when did you report it and how long did it take to like, actually fix the vulnerability? Okay, um, which ones? <laughs> <laughs> the Christmas one. The Christmas one. Okay, so the first two, the auth bypass and the um, sort of code execution, that took fairly quick, so that was like two weeks. The filter leak one, um, it was such a universal problem within the CMS. Like, the, that whole feature was the whole point of Strapi. So it took about two months to fix, um, so it was a pretty massive fix for them. Yes, Orlando? 
how long did it take from you submitting uh, Bon Jovi's to Scrappy to get a response and start the sort of process? Five to... minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you guys know it's read the book. <laughs> they were like pretty amazing. And it was amazing where me being a no life doing this on New Year's Eve, <laughs> getting responses from another no life. <laughs> no, not quite. Derek was um, cool. But um, yeah. No, it was pretty insane how fast they were responding to each of the reports. Um, yeah. Any, uh, yes? Uh, have you ever tried exploiting a closed source application? Sorry, what was that? Have you ever tried exploiting a closed source application? Um, that's my job. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is like the open source stuff is more just for fun. Um, or when I get bored or there's no CTF events on. Um, and yeah, and now we've got a full story from it. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, just a, uh, yeah. Did you consider reporting it as a CVE? Uh, yes, uh, I did. Well, what I did first was report it to the vendor. So I always sort of check what their security poli um, disclosure policy is. But then I did sort of send an email saying, look, we should do a coordinated disclosure of this because that way we can inform others about it with the CVE. Um, and also, I was because I was doing this for fun um, and stuff, and a big part of it's me sort of showing up as a team um, and sort of explaining about it. I did say I will be releasing a write up about it, um, but I sort of focus on more of the technical details and not just be like, "Here's a proof of concept, um, go and hack all the other servers." It was more like the actual technical details, so um, the people that knew and could understand it could sort of figure it out. Um, saying that, it was a bit funny, one of my friends was using Strappy and he was going through, uh, I gave him some indicators of compromise which I wrote and it was funny seeing all the bots which pretty much thought my example of the articles was a proof of concept and was scanning through and trying to exploit it without actually reading the article and reading and realising there was a lot more nuance to it. Cool, from the back. Right. Uh, how long did it take you to uh, which one? The RC one? Uh, yeah, all the scrappy stuff. So the RC one took about a few hours or so. Um, the leaks one probably took a bit longer, but it was more like I was just going back to work and it was sort of more going like every now and then after work, I was just sort of looking at it a little bit and then sort of suddenly I just sort of connected the dots that you could do it by those relational mappings, and then that's when it went down that rabbit hole. So I'd probably say a bit longer for that one. Cool. Carlos, well, thank you very much. Right. Well, 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 the CTF um, coming up 1st of September. Um, join along, I've put some web challenges in, which should be fun.